materials uh, define uh, the progress uh, of uh, humanity. In the Silicon Age, uh, electronic uh, and computer technology significantly accelerated uh, technical progress uh, and changed uh, our lives. Welcome, Marhaba. My name is uh, Lucia De Logu. I'm very happy to have you all here today. And uh, I have a secret for you. I bet the material we will discover together today, which are called Maxins, will improve several aspects of your everyday life for the years to come. Indeed, they can have uh, multiple uh, uses, uh, from energy storage to biomedical applications. Maxins have uh, unique properties that differentiate them from any other materials. Maxine properties are tunable by design. And uh, as we will learn today, Maxine have the most versatile man-made chemistry ever discovered in human history. So before we start, our journey into the future, into Maxine's, let me express my deepest gratitude to Professor Panchenaumov, the director of New York University Abu Dhabi Center for Smart Engineering Materials, for which we are grateful for the generous contribution to this event. I also thank the whole division of science and engineering, Professor Rafael Song, for helping us in this initiative. So Pancha, with his scientific vision, strongly supported me in this initiative of bringing in Abu Dhabi a global leader in science, Professor Yuri Gogozzi. Professor Yuri Gogozzi is a professor in material science and engineering at Drexel University in Philadelphia. He's not only present in the Clarivate highly cited list, also in the Stanford list, and he is among the top 10 cited scientists in the world among all disciplines. And this is based on his H index in the past five years. So in science, uh, the H index gives you an idea on the contribution in terms of publications and impact. Just to give you a number, on average, an associate professor in the middle of the career has an H index of about 20. He reached 209. <laughs> and uh, uh, this reveals the tremendous impact of his uh, research in the community uh, with uh, over uh, 200,000 uh, citations. Uh, Professor Gogozzi has over uh, 30 million uh, in sponsored research activities uh, over the past 20 years, 170 patents filed, about 70 granted, uh, and more than 30 patents uh, licensed to the industry. He has authored more than 800 articles and peer-reviewed journals, and we are talking about journals like Science, Nature, Advanced Materials, the top of the top. His contribution to science has been recognized with a very long list of awards, including the Ceramic Prize from the World Academy of Ceramics, the Material Research Society, MRS, medal, and the American Chemical Society Award, just to mention some of them. Thanks to his uh, groundbreaking works, he has been elected as a fellow of eight professional societies, and uh, uh, among them, I want to mention the US National Academy of Inventors. He recently joined as an honorary professor Sumi State University in Kiev, in Ukraine, and uh, uh, well, on top of this uh, astonishing, astonishing uh, list of uh, uh, achievements in his career, let me share that uh, he's also a great mentor, uh, a great uh, friend, 
and uh, he is also a never-ending uh, source of learning uh, beyond uh, the matrix uh, of uh, science. So Professor Yuri Gogozzi uh, at Drexel University, as uh, many of you already know, discovered Max Sins, a material of the future. I am pleased to have uh, the opportunity to introduce him to you, and I'm grateful he made the space on his uh, very busy uh, agenda, uh, flying from Philadelphia to here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so dear esteemed guests, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome him on stage. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining uh, me here today to listen about Maxine's, listen about our research. And of course, uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Professor Lucia Dalogo for this kind introduction. Thanks to Pancha for making it all possible, making this event happen. And I'm glad to be here. Um, I gave a technical talk uh, at NYU yesterday. I'm going to go much lighter on details today. So really what my goal is to introduce you these materials we discovered with my colleagues and students, uh, Maxines, where M stands for transition metal, like a red dots you can see in this schematic, and X, carbon, nitrogen, and they come in a variety of different flavors. Like you can see this plasmonic colors of Maxines. But I also talk about how material discoveries are made. I will talk a little bit about role of two-dimensional materials and why Maxine's graphene other materials are considered to be building blocks for future technologies, things here. So basically, I will talk about role of materials, how they evolve, and you can see whether non-technology revolution is really com coming and whether we use 2D materials and other non-materials uh, to enable it. This will be your judgment to exercise. And of course, we do many different things. You can actually see cover of a paper in advanced materials published very recently together with Professor DeLogo on novel biomedical application of Maxine to tag cells and uh, do uh, cytometry on single cells here, but there are many others. But let me step back and tell you a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in uh, Ukraine and educated in Ukraine. This is the reason actually why I'm trying to help now joining by one of top Ukrainian universities in uh, lecturing online. And I started to work initially on ceramic materials, high temperature ceramics for ceramic engines. And in the beginning in Ukraine, and later as a Humboldt fellow in, uh, fellow in Germany, I worked on ceramics. Ceramics for engines. Can you raise hand? How many of you are driving cars with ceramic engines now? I don't see any hands raised. And there are none. So what it also means, the first lesson I learned, we can do our job as scientists, engineers. We develop ceramic engines. They could run 100,000 miles reliably. But they have not become industrial reality because economy at the end decides what becomes here. But as scientists, we try to discover, we make new materials, as engineers, we develop new designs and new products here. And then the market decides finally what goes here. So we should never be disappointed. We try to do our job well. And then sometimes it's our, out of our hands. But when I went as a postdoc on GSPS fellowship to Japan, I started to work on carbon nanomaterials and spent next 10 years, or well, more actually uh, than that, working on nanostructured carbon. Nanotubes, graphene, porous carbide derived carbon. We discovered a couple of new carbon morphologies, and I'm still teaching a carbon course in, in uh, Drexel. Actually, did it from Abu Dhabi yesterday night and will uh, continue tomorrow here. But after moving to the US in 96, I started to look into other new areas. And many of these changes happen not because I plan to move from ceramics to carbon, from carbon to maxine. It's a serendipity, 
It's basically circumstances and I will try to tell you how it happens here. So since 2011, when we discovered Maxine's, we have been working on exploring this family of materials. I am working now at Drexel University for people who don't know. It's in Philadelphia. It's uh, between uh, Washington DC and New York. Uh, so basically about two hours uh, from each of them. So on the Eastern coast of the United States. It's a big private university, was founded by A.J. Drexel, the founder of Wall Street Modern Financial System together with J.P. Morgan. He uh, was extremely rich. Uh, funded uh, uh, Rockefellers, funded creation of uh, railroads in the US. And just to give you an idea, his niece, Catherine, was basically gave money to build 20 colleges and universities in Southern United States. Catholic Church made her saint uh, for this good deeds here. But this is what you see, the first building of the university, and this is actually my website, group website. If you wanna go in technical details, learn more about Maxine's and nanoscience, go and check here. My lab is now in a different building. You see this is a very modern building. Some of you may recognize the style. Uh, EMP, the same architect who built pyramids of Louvre, and we were working on design of this building uh, after I joined Drexel here. So my uh, lab, uh, my institute occupies pretty much the entire floor in this uh, nice modern building here. So I'm doing research. I have a group of about 50 people at the moment, but also coordinate nanotech activities at Drexel. Just to kind of uh, give you my perspective and my background. So I always try to look broader than my specific research area. Because I think this is how you find interest in things. Also, my main appointment in material science engineering, and I will tell you in a second what material scientists do, but I also have joint appointments or Carter's appointments in chemistry and mechanical engineering departments. So you see like a spreading very, very broadly here. But really, whatever I do, it's the mechanics of materials or synthesis and chemistry, it's all built on materials, discovery, development, studying structure properties, and finding applications. Materials is basically applied science, or I would say the basis for all the engineering sciences, because everything is made of materials in our materials world. And progress of humanity, as you already heard from uh, Lucia, was really determined by materials. People who learn how to make uh, bronze knife uh, and uh, spears were able to defeat people with stone tools. People who made iron tools were able to uh, succeed in both agriculture and wars and moving the world into iron age for many centuries here. And I'm sure you all have your smartphones now with you. Many probably have laptop computers, smartwatches, other devices. We are living in the silicon age today. But what is the future? And many, including myself, believe that we will move to really nano future. And the real reason is that whether people work on stone, they would take a large stone and carve something out of it a piece. Or last century, when industrial, two centuries ago, when industrial revolution started, take a chunk of metal, machine it, and make uh, gears, make uh, other things out of this metal. And even now in silicon, people produce large ingot, like a single crystal of that size, slice it in wafers, make devices, dice, carve, so carving something out here. There is a lot of waste, there are a lot of machining. The ideas we are developing is that we need to have nanoscale, tiny building blocks, few atoms, uh, hundreds of atoms, thousands of atoms maybe here, and build things exactly in the shape, size needed, without carving it out of something. And what we do nowadays, we are trying to create these building blocks, develop them, because some of them are available, some not. And if we succeed, we also can not only make things without any waste, but what is more important, 
we will be able to achieve properties that don't exist in any single bulk materials. So this is kind of a goal of our research, developing nanomaterials, but also simulating biological system like nature was building nanoscale and hybridizing materials here. And what we believe it will help us to do, solve key problems humanity faces, whether you are in Abu Dhabi or United States or Ukraine, we all have safe have the same problems, developing energy from new renewable cleaner sources, providing drinking water and water for irrigation, food, solving environmental problems, and of course, health uh, and disease here. So I don't know what your visa are future technologies, but also I think in the very near future, we will be moving to the world when we'll be using flexible, wearable, connected, devices using renewable energy, that we harvest energy, that we move from cell phones, basically initially large computers, laptops like I have, iPads, cell phones, we will have electronics embedded everywhere, internet of things. What is also a reason why we need nanoscale materials, nanoscale devices. You cannot make flexible, transparent electronic using a silicon wafer. You cannot make devices, epidermal, for example, sensors that can be able to send signal monitoring your health to your doctor, who may be not in Abu Dhabi, who may be in New York City uh, or in Frankfurt. So we need new materials to enable these technologies here. And of course, everyone talks about energy and water, sustainable future, moving beyond just uh, burning oil and gas, we will still need oil and gas, but I think it's a much smarter way to use those natural resources to produce new materials which available us to tap into renewable technologies, things here. So basically, how do we do it? It's not necessarily easy, not necessarily obvious. People argue about global warming, people argue about ways to go forward, who is right, who is wrong. And already Max Planck said here that new scientific truth, uh, basically truth does not triumph by convincing its opponent. So if I preach you and tell you nanomaterials are great, it doesn't mean that you all believe me. But life will show. People, basically technologies will survive, which really are useful here. And Pretty much, it's normal for humans to be conservative. We got used to something. Switching from gasoline-driven cars to electrical cars is not easy. I want to buy my next car, electric car. My brother tells me, no, I like long rides until it gives me 700 kilometers at least. I'm not going to buy one here. It's normal here. But what is also real that Every science engineering field is evolving. And what is also to enable these discoveries, enable this future, we need to see how new science emerges at the interfaces of other disciplines. And we work on materials that go in biological system. We use artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, uh, machine learning to guide discovery of new materials. And I think this is very, very important to move forward, exploring things that have not been done before. And one of those is, of course, nanoscale materials. Nanoscale building blocks that people just could not see 40, 50 years ago and could not appreciate or think that it will be possible to build something with invisible materials here. And really, very large step forward towards a real nanotechnology was Discovery made by Andre Gaiman, Kostin Vasilov, two scientists from Manchester, and I know they have been uh, to Abu Dhabi. Uh, they collaborate uh, with some researchers here. They basically show that peeling off monatomic layer from a graphite crystal can give materials with new properties. Basically, appreciation is not only small, they are different when you separate them from the bulk here. But what is even more important, very quickly, they themselves started to tell the world that it's not just graphene. 
there are many other two-dimensional materials. And some of them are very well known, clay. People don't appreciate the fact that clay is one of the most widely used nanomaterials. They are in bumper of every car, clay, reinforcing composite materials. That's why if you rearrange someone at speed 10, 15 kilometers per hour, it just bounces back, would not happen a couple of decades ago. It's a 2D material. There are other materials, like uh, boronitride, molydisulfide, which we use as solid lubricants, can also be separated and actually have been separated, uh, well, had been separated even before graphene. But what is important? Appreciation of the fact there are interesting properties in 2D have driven scientists to explore making other materials two-dimensional state, including materials for which there were no like a layered precursor. You cannot just peel off or share two-dimensional sheets like a stack of paper like this one and get single sheets from a stack, like a graphite, and you take a separate and this is graphene. People learn how to take materials which are seemingly inseparable, like a silicon with diamond structure and make it in single layers. And why it's important? Because if you want to build the future technology, we need not only dielectric materials, for example, like clay or boronitride, not only semiconducting materials like molydisulfide or silicon. We need also metallic materials. And actually, maxines you will hear about really contributed to basically playing the closing game in the 2D materials world, bringing what was missing there. So we basically need bolts and nuts of all sizes. We need materials of all colors, all electronic properties, all possible mechanical properties, then we can build something out of them here. So basically what is happening now? When people for a long time are thinking of wonder materials, okay, obsidian is better than just uh, regular granite stone, uh, steel is better than cast iron, cast iron was better than bronze. Now we're talking about really having thousands of building blocks for bu building machine and devices that we need to learn how to assemble. We cannot assemble them manually. We cannot even program and think how to assemble them unless we use computational science, unless we use artificial intelligence machine learning. But computational sciences are developing very quickly and materials family is catching up. Moreover, it's not one material. We will need to create heterostructures. We we'll assemble basically heterostructure means that we basically get different materials together, bringing properties, dielectric, separating, conducting materials, preventing short circuits. Semiconductor coupling with metallic layer, providing electrons for switching here. And of course, there is room here for zero dimensional material like fullerene, soccer ball shaped molecules, nanodiamond particles, quantum dots, and one dimensional materials, nanotubes, nanowires, and so on here. So those are all building blocks for the future technology here. So what happens in my life as a result? I started with carbides, silicon carbide, silicon nitride, nitrides for ceramic engines for high temperature application, bulk materials, move to carbon nanomaterials, and then move back to carbides and nitrides. So compounds of metal and carbon or nitrogen for people who are outside of uh, uh, chemical material sciences, things here, but on a two-dimensional scale. So basically uh, the full uh, loop uh, closing here. And I will spend uh, another half an hour talking about those materials. This is a book. There are actually already a couple of other books available, and there are at least three more books I know now in preparation on Maxine's here. So we look at them at building blocks for all critical technologies, from energy harvesting, storage, to environment, to uh, basically large-scale manufacturing devices, to medical technologies. But again, let's take a step back. And let me tell you how the materials were discovered. I was asked this question yesterday uh, when giving a technical talk, and I promised to do it today here. 
And what is also important, especially a message to younger generation, students, uh, postdocs, young scientists here in the room. You should realize that any discovery happens after you experience lots of failures. So if you go to the lab, you do something your professor told you to do, or you uh, think yourself it's a great thing to do, and nothing happens, it is normal. Moreover, let me tell you, if you only do things that are predictably going to happen, you are too conservative. Your chances to make something important, discover something is low. You need to push yourself and work you do beyond of limits, beyond basically of a human can achieve, beyond what you think is possible. Then there is a chance you really find something impossible. Impossible takes a little bit longer, but it happens sometimes here. And also, you don't know when a discovery is going to happen, when you get a breakthrough. You do a diligence, you work, you read, you learn, you try your best, you analyze errors that you make here. But it may happen a year, it may happen five years after you start your research. But again, it's important to like a push limits of knowledge. And when you expand this horizon, you will find across something really exciting things here. So because it's a journey, a journey, a, journey, a really journey to terra incognita place unknown here. And I'm citing uh, Barry Sharpless. Uh, you may recognize his name just last year. He got his second Nobel Prize in chemistry for click chemistry, amazing. I think he's the only living uh, scientist who has two Nobel Prizes won here. And this is exactly what he said here. I imagine for most of you, it's a big surprise to learn that we're making new discoveries and concerns. Failure is really path to success. So again, never, never give up. Follow your path. If you believe in yourself, if you believe in work you do, you will achieve something here. And basically, this is how we discovered Maxens. We were not planning on making new two-dimensional materials. Moreover, when I came to Drexel University, I interacted with my colleague, Professor Michel Barzum, who is known as a father of so-known max phases, structures you actually see here. Uh, I lost my pointer somewhere, it went away. Which consists of these red layers are aluminum silicon atoms, and the blue ones are those MX layer, carbides and nitrides. And I asked Michel, can we like exfoliate them or make nanotubes out of them? He told me, no, impossible. They have strong bonds, covalent bonds, a unique bond between these layers. You cannot break them down. However, what happened? We did it. And we did it by etching Max phases, just throwing it. And I'm not sure why my video is not working. Well, it used to work the animation here, believe me, uh, when we tested it before the talk here. But basically what we did, we put this material into acid and etch aluminum or silicon layers away, making these two-dimensional layers out of etched material. So pretty much breaking strong bonds in max phase, separating them, making them look something like exfoliated graphite or vermiculite clay, layers weakly bonded, and then separating single layers here. Now, why we did it here? Not because we were initially that smart and I wanted to basically show to my colleagues that he's wrong and I'm right. We did it because I had another idea which actually failed. I thought that for battery electrodes, we can take these max phases, oops, sorry, I wanted to go back for a second, containing silicon with these layers of silicon conducting layer of carbide with carbon, silicon that can take more lithium than carbon, and I thought, and it's layered like graphite, and I thought it would be a great anode material. I asked one of my PhD students to do DFT calculations, and he calculated the barrier for getting lithium in is not very high, it should be possible. We wrote a proposal together with Michel Barzum to Department of Energy in the US, and 
they were silly enough to give us a million dollars for four years to explore max phases and a node for lithium ion batteries. And we hired a very good student, Michael Nagib. He was originally from Egypt, coming so from the region. He was the best student in my uh, thermodynamics class. He started to do experiments, and he could not get silic uh, lithium in very small amount, 10 times less than graphite anode. Well, he wanted to continue PhD study and not lose his funding, give money to the Department of Energy back with apologies. So we started to brainstorm and think how we can overcome the problem. So we thought, okay, maybe if a little bit edge material selectively as we did it before for carbides to remove metals, we will make room for silicon. But we tried many solvents again. We, it means that Michael was going to the lab, coming back with another disappointment to us. We brainstormed with him and told me, try this, try that. Finally, he found that hydrofluoric acid can damage max phases, and he decided to try hydrofluoric acid. As a result, he got these layers, sheets that you can see in this picture after etching is achieved initially here. And when he gave it to my postdoc to do microscopy, my postdoc, Jun Jin Yu, he's a professor now too, just like Michael, told me, you got graphene, because there was thin two-dimensional sheets very similar to graphene visually. But after he did more detailed analysis, he realized, no, it's not graphene, this is carbide. So basically, again, there is no warranty of success. You fail in one, you basically succeed in something else, you need to try. Basically, repeating what uh, Barry uh, told here, uh, make discoveries, failure is a path to success, you fail in one thing, you basically is explore another path, and you may be safe. So serendipity is really something that is basically a sign of many discoveries. You can read a lot of uh, anecdotes in literature, how things were discovered by accident here. So again, but still, luck favors only the prepared mind, as Louis Pasteur said here. So it doesn't mean that you go and do something you have no clue about, and you will find something important. You need to be prepared, you need to learn, you need to consider all the options and try to select the best one here. Now, let me also continue the story for those who got disappointed after making discovery, after doing something important, submitting paper and getting your paper rejected. Well, this is exactly what happens actually to Guy Manavasolov paper initially when submitted it to Nature and it was rejected. It happens to the first Maxine paper. We submitted it to two of the top journals and it bounced back without review. Editors wrote something, well, there are so many two-dimensional materials already, remember. It happened in early 2011 when we submitted the paper. So it was just a few months after Gaiman and Vasilov got Nobel Prize for graphene. New materials were emerging, two-dimensional materials. Who would care for another 2D material things here? It bounced back. So, we knew that it's important. We knew that there were, at that time, already about 70 max phases known, now more than 150. And we knew that it will be an entire family emerging. So I contacted an editor who published a couple of my papers, Lauren Stimson, and convinced her that we have something important. She should send it to reviewers. Reviewers will like it. Do you know what happens a month later? We got three low warm reviews telling, well, yes, it looks like something new, but you have not studied properties. How will it be better than other 2D material discovered and so on? And the paper was rejected. We send it for, we basically uh, contact Lauren and look, we believe it's important, please send it for adjudication. And it went to a reviewer whose name I only learned 10 years after discovery, uh, when I asked uh, advanced material to contact the reviewer and check uh, whether the reviewer would uh, not mind uh, to uh, tell who he was. It appeared to be Professor Vincent Munier. He is actually now department head at Penn State. He moved very recently, thanks here. And he wrote very short, basically, this is the entire review I'm showing to you here. 
that basically result a very important successful isolation of a new two-dimensional crystal by itself should warrant publication in a prestigious journal such as advanced materials. Well, this paper became quickly one of the most accessed and most cited in the entire journal. Uh, Ten years later, they published uh, article or a special issue basically celebrating 10 years of discovery. A few years before that, Lorna Stimson came to me with a bottle of champagne at one of the Valley Reception Conference and told me, Yuri, let's celebrate that we published your work in our journal here. So again, even after you have done something, it's not like immediately everyone will recognize how good what you do. It's sometimes uh, quite a torturous path with disappointment here. But again, if you know it's important, if you believe it here, you will overcome. Wherever it gets published, uh, it will get eventually recognized here. And just a couple of months ago, Alberto Mascatelli, editor-in-chief of uh, Nature Nana, uh, wrote uh, himself an editorial on the pull of Maxine Vortex, how Maxines now attract everyone. And you really will see that there is a very quickly rise just in the first few years, because initially the growth was slow. People believed, OK, there are so many other materials, vice bother. But now it started to pick. People realize properties of Maxine's here. Still, the first Maxine, Michael Nagib, synthesized titanium 32. Uh, and he was a PhD student uh, supervised by uh, Michelle Barzum and myself here. It's still the most studied. And we can actually make many Maxine's. Let me tell you how many, approximately. We can make Maxine's using as M this transition metals, blue. But you can also add, actually, lanthanides instead of scandium nitrium there. We can make them with carbon nitrogen. Lately, we show also with oxygen. They come initially at least three structures. My students, actually undergraduate students, discovered another group of max phases and maxines a few years ago, adding four. So multiply dozen of these materials by four, by two, you will end up roughly the 100 structures, not even counting oxygen. At least 10 different surface terminations are possible. Oxygen, hydroxyl, chalcogens, halogens. I mean, multiply by 10, you end up with about 1,000 of possible stoichiometric composition only. But we can also match and mix transition metals, making solid solution on M side, like alloys, actually also making high entropy materials, where we have four to five elements mixed together. We can also make carbon nitride mixing carbon nitrogen. It by itself takes the number to basically infinity of possible compositions. But we're also pushing atomistic design of materials. We can make not like a, this type of a simple structures, we can make materials which will be atomic sandwiches, like out of plain order at Maxine, we call them, with one element, for example, uh, moly or chromium being on the surface, another element making inner layer. The element and outer layer controls catalytic chemical, electrochemical properties. The metal in the inner layer controls transport electrons, for example. Moreover, we can make materials with alternating atomic columns or etch them away, make like a lines of missing atoms vacancies. So basically, sky is the limit. We can truly do atomistic design of materials. And if we have calculations, DFT, molecular dynamic simulation, telling us properties of materials as a function of composition and structure, we'll be able to design materials with virtually any set of possible properties because we have such a large space to work with here. Moreover, what is also important, you can make materials out of platinum and uh, uh, transuranian elements. They may be fun, but they will probably not find large volume applications. Most of materials we make, we make out of titanium, carbon, nitrogen, max phases with aluminum silicon, so some of the most abundant element. What it means is we can make them potentially in large quantities. We can produce them in volumes for applications here. And this is again makes it real, makes materials that are 
not containing, for example, tellurium being not only toxic, but also as rare as platinum, actually a bit more rare I think, than platinum in Earth's crust here. They can be used not only for electronic application, but in larger quantities. And even in our laboratory, we can make kilogram quantities of maxine. This is one of my postdocs, John Jung, holding one kilo of maxine produced using reactor designed for us uh, by uh, Materials Research Center uh, in Ukraine. And 24 hours, we made this material. Another four days of week, and we delaminated it all in solutions. Moreover, what is also wonderful about these materials, we have oxygen OH on the surface. So they are hydrophilic like clay. Consider them to be a conducting clay or water-soluble metal. You just put them in water. They have high negative charge, uh, well, zeta potential for chemist is below minus 30. So they basically disperse in water, forming stable colloidal solution. And you put some material and you see like a different colors correspond to different maxine in water, they dissolve. So basically we take ceramic powder, we dump it into reactor with solution of ancient or emulsion salt, we make this multi-layer materials similar to clay, which can be shared very easily, separated, and then we make a colloidal solution of flakes. What is very important, if you want to dissolve graphene in water or metal nanoparticles that have conductivity, you have to use surfactants that will not form colloidal solutions. Here, you don't have any edit, you don't have to burn it afterwards here. And depending on concentration, you can make it dilute, for example, for inject printing, or you can make a very thick solution like honey. It's a liquid crystalline, and you can draw fibers, or you can make films by doctor blading, for example, spreading it over the surface. And just controlling size of particle concentration water, we can get any concentration. Why it's important? Because now we can manufacture out of it. We can make films, we can make three-dimensional foams, we can pattern, we can use any known technique, 2D printing, 3D printing, 4D printing, changing other parameters in time, spin coating, blade coating, deep coating. You can take your T-shirt, dip into dispersion of maxine in water, take it out, and it will keep you warm because it will not emit infrared. It may make you invisible to infrared devices uh, at night because, again, it won't emit an infrared. It also will stop your cell phone from having reception or keep your uh, credit card uh, safe from being stolen because it will provide electromagnetic shielding and many other properties here. So what is important? We have a huge, enormous family of designer materials. We can control structure, composition. We can make them out of abundant elements. We can produce them in large quantities. We can process them from pure water solutions. Nothing else, no additional toxic chemical added for processing, which is very important for manufacturing here. But does it all matter? And it only matters if those materials have some useful properties. In addition to the ones I just listed to you, things here. And they do. It's really the only material I know that combines truly metallic conductivity. Keep in mind, graphene being praised for its conductivity is a zero band gap semiconductor. There are many other materials, semi-metal. Maxine have so we call high density of state at the Fermi level, high concentration of carrier. So it has plenty of electrons, d electrons, transition metals, most of them. But at the same time, it's water soluble, processable. And the surface of maxine, actually, let me jump a slide forward, looks like a surface of transition metal. It's covered by oxygen OH, like oxide. So it can change oxidation state. You can store energy in it. You can do catalysis with moly, tungsten, titanium, catalytic elements. Moly, vanadium, titanium are the same elements that are used in batteries for storing energy. We can do things that transition metal cannot do. Moreover, there is something else very important. Why is all modern electronics made of 
semiconductor, use a semiconductor. Because semiconductor, one can inject charge and control basically properties, change properties. Move electrons from valence zone to conduction zone, things here. In metals, conventional metals, you cannot do it. You can apply potential, nothing happens. It has plenty of electrons, it won't change its properties by a bit. In maxines, because of this, like a oxide and surface metal here, you can actually tune properties by changing oxidation state reversibly of transition metal on the surface. So it's a basically metals with tunable Fermi level. So what it may enable now, new generation of electronics made of metallic materials, sensors, uh, optoelectronic devices, and many, many other things here. And in addition, there are many other useful properties. For example, it has breakdown current, like two orders of magnitude higher than copper, similar to graphene. In bulk, in a film, like for example, film you see here, it is order of magnitude more conducting than reducing graphene oxide, which is used to make like a thicker layers and films here. It has very high mechanical strengths. Carbides like titanium carbide, tungsten carbide, they use for machining metals, making cutting tools. They're very hard, very strong, high modulus material. They're stable, and you saw in my first picture, they have plasmonic colors. Actually, this is titanium 2C carbide. Uh, you may know that the first example of human-made nanotechnology, people claim, is Lycurgus cup from fourth year Roman uh, cup, glass cup, which is green if you look at this reflection, and it's red if you look in transmission. This is titanium to see. It does exactly the same because it has transfer surface plus more than 550 nanometer, just like gold nanoparticles. There is a big difference. It doesn't contain gold. So we can make plasmonic materials, not out of noble metal particles, but of very, very common elements here. And there are many other properties I'm not going to talk about today. And I think I'm approaching like the last 10 minutes I have uh, from the time given for my talk. So basically, all these properties determine applications, whether we go to optoelectronic, electronic devices, sensing, optics, biomaterials, because majority of material biocompatible, shielding. Maxine, the best shielding materials uh, reported so far, make the thinnest best shield, but also because we can make them in large quantities and process easily. They can go beyond electronic or opt-electronic applications that people consider for majority of uh, 2D materials, because only like a graphene, clay, molydesulfide, couple of other 2D materials can be made in quantities here. We can basically go to building batteries, solar panels, other devices which require membranes for water desalination, which require a larger amount of materials. What you see here is actually one micron thick film of maxine produced by taking colloidal solution, spreading this over the surface and drying. You get material with the strength of aluminum foil. One micron film can already be handled, freestanding. You can make a paper airplane out of it, but it has conductivity of 15,000 siemens per centimeter, 10 times larger than you would get, for example, making graphene oxide process a similar way, heating to a few hundred degrees C to make a film here. So again, we can reach to many applications, maybe eventually once to construction, people already put graphene into cement here. But in our group, we work on largely energy storage application, supercapacitor batteries, again, I told you already, Maxine can store energy. You can intercalate lithium ions or other ions between the layers. You have transition metal changing oxidation state, so potentially it can work as a battery material now. And this was our initial goal. Remember, was together with Professor Barzum and Michael Nagib, we were trying to get lithium in. However, everyone talks about fast charging. Reason my brother doesn't want to buy an electric car because if you want to go far away, he will have to wait for an hour, at least a couple of hours to recharge battery at a stop. So what is holding us 
from getting fast charging batteries. One of the key reasons is conductivity. Think what does it mean to charge battery quickly? It simply means to run very high current through a battery. And you know, you don't need to be an, uh, really an engineer to know that if you run high current through poor conductor, you have joule heating. So your battery, if you try to charge it too quickly, will overheat, may explode, catch fire. That's why actually all modern cars have, electric cars have very sophisticated cooling systems for batteries here. Maxines are at least two orders of magnitude higher compared to other materials used in batteries. So it can potentially have higher charging. There is no solid state diffusion because the all two dimensional sheet, all charge storage happen on the surface. So there is a potential to really redesign electrical energy storage devices, combine like a capacitor surface charging with battery-like redox processes, making three-dimensional fast charging storage devices. However, there is a lot to learn how to do it because we need to better understand how to do it here. There are applications in many other fields. Biomedical, that's what we're exploring uh, with Lucia together. And you see there is a very fast growth there. And actually, this picture was created uh, by Flavia Vitale, a colleague from Penn, uh, last summer. So now this bar uh, is uh, somewhere here, pretty much doubled. It was just for half a year. And they can be used for epidermal electronic, for implantable electronic, for tracking cells, for treating cancer using the same photothermal therapy effect, because some other maxine have plasma resonances in infrared to destroy a cancer cell or other application. And sometimes applications are quite unusual. Just a week uh, ago, this article was published in one of the biggest uh, US newspapers, the Philadelphia Inquirer. One of my PhD students, who is from China, who uh, uh, likes uh, and learn as he was a kid, uh, uh, doing basically Chinese calligraphy. And he decided to start again, kind of uh, to calm down after unsuccessful experiments during the COVID era, uh, relearn the, again, technique. And what we faced when he was diluting the ink the ink would kind of spread too easily on paper. He had to get very special paper here. Then he decided to try Maxine solution as ink. And what he found that he gets always like a sharp lines, independent level of dilution of the ink and viscosity, and can draw or paint, for example, these flowers on filter paper. So it's a basically kind of a paper that would very easily spread anything things here, and you can get nicely here. So Philadelphia Inquirer published an article on occasion of Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year, to kind of tell. So you know, like, sometimes you go just like a, a Friday experiment uh, that uh, Kostya Novoselov and Andre Gaim did in Andre Gaim's lab, exploring things that are go outside beyond your call of duty, beyond what do research here, he found some another interesting application, improving on Chinese ink that has a uh, couple of thousand years of history. And of course, there are many other applications I didn't just have time to talk about today, and I need to wrap up my presentation, including energy harvesting storage, shielding antennas, communication technology, optoelectronics, water desalination, and gases separation. For example, extremely good separation of hydrogen from hydrocarbon, CO2, or nitrogen here. Biomedical application, I mentioned briefly a couple of times here. And these materials are beautiful. We're trying to move from science to application, but again, for people here who are not necessarily scientists. There is also art to do there. And we take this black and white microscopic images. We color them. My former postdoc, Baba Kanasuri, also a professor now, started this, and we run an international competition. Last year, we got a submission from about 100 of countries, and it's beautiful. And actually, you can do it yourself. You can submit a picture and win prizes up to $1,000, top prize here. And we produce uh, every year calendars. This is a 2023 calendar using some of the images from non-artography. Coming, you can read in the back 
from many different countries around the world. And feel free to grab one of these calendars uh, as long as supply lasts uh, after the talk here. So science is beautiful. You can make useful things. You can make just beautiful things like calligraphy or painting on silk uh, or uh, drawing as picture. So basically, I'm not going to give you technical conclusions here. What I want to say here is that you want to develop materials that will change the world. You need to believe yourself in your ideas. You don't know whether they're going to change the world, like ceramic materials I produced when I was a student and postdocs, or they may, like many other materials, discovered that really led to new technologies, light emitting diodes, uh, uh, materials in TV, making TVs flat from the tubes uh, I used to watch when I was younger, things here. Enabling all your smartphones, there are a lot of nano uh, very thin stuff there, and many other technologies we are enjoying today here. But you need to look critically at your work. You need to know what has been done by people before you started your work here, otherwise you may be just repeating some more work here. And you need to look at it critically, because it doesn't matter when the paper was written by a famous scientist, maybe Nobel Prize winner. It doesn't mean necessarily the correct, it doesn't mean necessarily that it cannot be done better here. And also, sometimes others told you, no, it's not promising. Well, it's too difficult for your PhD study. You probably will not get uh, results that can be easily and quickly published here. Again, if you believe, you think it's important, if you like it and excited about of it, just again, follow your dream, believe yourself, never, never give up. And I'm sure you will succeed. And this is, believe me, my very last slide. All the successes, all this uh, numerous publications, uh, citations that came, come just because great work done by group members. I have people from 15 different countries in my group. You can see picture taken last summer. Um, but we also collaborate with many, many different people. This is a list very far from complete. I didn't include Lucia, you have heard too many times about her, but there are many other outstanding collaborators like her, uh, which uh, have been left there because I don't know everything, I know very little about biosciences. I knew nothing about electromagnetic interference shielding, and our first paper on the topic published with uh, Korean colleague is now the most cited paper in the field ever, within five years actually is still here. So again, Collaborate. If you don't know something, don't hesitate to go find colleagues, talk to other people and tell me, can you help me with this? I think it may be a good idea, it may work. Can you work with me on these things here? And again, successes will come. And finally, once again, showing our group website, there's plenty of information there. We'll be teaching a course on Maxine's in two weeks. If anyone wants to sign up and learn more, five-day online course. And Think how you can use this wonderful family materials and other materials in whatever sphere of activities you have. And if you're not a scientist, an artist, maybe you'll create beautiful images for nanotechnology or acquire some Maxine ink for your next painting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuri, for uh, this uh, astonishing talk. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Um, I think there are microphones, so uh, we need to wait uh, till the microphone comes because uh, the lecture is being recorded. There will be on both sides assistants providing microphones. Um, thank you very much, uh, sir, for your, uh, for your interesting talk. I actually have two questions. Uh, we know that nanomaterials in general, they exhibit agglomeration as a problem. So is that also a problem that is predominant in vaccines? Uh, my second question is regarding the EMI shielding property. So do all vaccine nanomaterials have this kind of property? Mm -hmm. And how can we make the most out of this property? So do we add them to, for example, a polymeric matrix and we coat the surface that we want to protect from EMI? Or how is yeah. it? 
Thank you very uh, both much. excellent questions. Uh, let uh, me uh, start with the first question. They have less a problem of agglomeration in solutions just because of this high negative charge. You can imagine with the float in solution, there is a repulsion. But this will be case in water or in uh, polar solvents, for example, propylene carbonate or uh, alcohol. But if you put them in, for example, benzene or toluene, they will agglomerate because they are in hydrophobic solvent. So it depends on the situation. When you put them in air, together particles, they will stick to each other. Good thing, they will not dust, so there is no inhalation uh, challenges and risks here. However, to separate them again, you will need to redisperse them again. So in aqueous solution, this is really not a problem, but again, it depends on the environment. Let me move to the next question. There are enormous difference in ability of machine provide electromagnetic shielding. So basically reflect or absorb electromagnetic waves like radio waves coming from say your phone or radar. Titanium 32, the most conducting machine, and I didn't include slides here, but we published this paper in Science in uh, uh, 2016, shows that it aligns the shielding properties with copper and aluminum, but you can make a freestanding one micron sheet and it already provide 99.999% of reflection of all electromagnetic waves. Now, surprise. Two years later, I got a visiting student, a Pakistani guy coming from Korean laboratory to work with me at Drexel from my Korean collaborator. And we decided to check whether it's really conductivity because many other maxine had much lower shielding. We took titanium carbonitride, same structure. We just replaced 50% of carbon atom with nitrogen. And we knew this material had exactly an order of magnitude lower electronic conductivity. This material appeared to per outperform the same thickness, even copper with about three orders of magnitude higher conductivity. There is still no theory explaining interaction of electromagnetic waves with nanometer thin, one billion centimeter, two-dimensional materials. This was another paper in science a couple of years later. So there are things we still don't fully understand. But following up also polymers, if you want maxine to reflect, you take titanium 32. But if you want to absorb radiation, make it, for example, rather invisible stealth, you need to disperse maxine in a polymer matrix and take a different one that has different um, optical properties, which has basically different uh, uh, constant of material. And uh, well, I don't think polymer matters. We took actually, uh, you can take uh, polyamide, PVDF, something that basically uh, transparent to RF, because our goal was not really to design new stealth materials. We do basic science in the lab. We wanted to show that, for example, vanadium-based maxine can also absorb radiation if they disperse, not forming a continuous network. So again, while we have know some principles now, for example, and lacking physics, and this again task for people who do physics, fundamental physics, we still need to understand fully this interaction. Traditionally, we consider it those are free electrons of metal that provide shielding here. And it appears to be lots of things we still don't understand the fundamental physics level. So there is some kind of a new physics emerging here as well, which need to be understood. Then we can do predictive uh, design of materials here. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, um, it was a great lecture. I was delighted to, to assist here. And I became a, a, a maximaniac at this point. I want to coin <laughs> this new word. Um, I mean, is one one thing that I'm very curious to know about uh, in medicine, particularly for uh, you know biocompatibility. I think it's one of the things. So mm -hmm. if you if you think or maybe you advise that it can be possible in the future, mm -hmm. and in, in the terms of that, how much you believe mm -hmm. that this can be applied in medical science, not only for medical devices mm -hmm. or maybe to use mm -hmm. this new technology mm -hmm. to repair tissues to use for stands, for instance, for mm -hmm. surgery, or maybe for, for other purposes. No. And last question is, 
Um, if you believe that, do you believe that this new technology can encounter some possible issues uh, in inciting maybe the immune system towards that, mm -hmm. or this is not the case? Well, probably our uh, chair is a better person to answer this question, but uh, let me give a brief answer. A number of vaccines have been tested, studied, and showed that they are biocompatible, hemocompatible. And you, again, you can look at surface of titanium 3 c 2 like titanium dioxide. Basically, or titanium metal, which is conventionally used for surgical implants, for example, for hip implants. So, from that standpoint, you can bring this analogy. Now, there are some vaccines containing chromium, vanadium, this vacancy lines. What will be the effect? It's still to be studied. Certain group of vaccines, like uh, niobium, tantalum based, Lucia studied, number of others are biocompatible. And there was a very interesting situation in our vaccine conference in Drexel University last summer in August. There were, we had a panel on biomedical application. Lucia was one of the panelists. Another panelist came from the US, Professor Flavia Vitale. And another panelist came from uh, England, from UK, from University of Brighton, Susie Sanderman. And they all were talking about different things. And then discussion started about immune report, activation of immune system here. And they're basically three like are looking at each other in surprise. Wow, we got this result. Oh yes, we also observed it and we observed it here. So this is some, you mostly see actually discussion with the scientists, well, no, I didn't get the same. I got opposite here. And here it was a very interesting kind of a positive response. So I think it's possible. There are really very good results, starting from this work on epidermal electronics, where we pretty much can again replace in electromyography, EEG, as application, metal electrodes, uh, like a gold or platinum electrode or silver electrodes for long-term studies, to implantable electrode to photothermal therapy. But there is enormous amount of information we're lacking. Are there any long-term effect? What is the uh, uh, basically pass for removal after photothermal therapy produced oxide, hydroxides here? Do you want to add anything, Lucia? Okay. Mm -hmm. But again, we're excited about it. But one thing also, message. We still are just scratching the surface of this field of materials. A lot of things we don't know. And I told you about great thing about Maxine, but there are also challenges. Starting from the fact that having so many materials is blessing and a curse at the same time. How you do select them? How all these possible changes in surface chemistry, depending on the synthesis, affect properties, including cytotoxicity, biocompatibility? So we need to answer many of those questions because maxine, before vaccines will become industrial reality, especially in fields like health and medicine. Hello, Professor Yuri. Thank you very much for the interesting and educative talk. So my first question, something caught my interest is uh, a sentence that was uh, said by Professor Lucia, which is uh, these materials can be fine-tuned <coughs> to produce the properties that we want. And this is, I believe, it's the future. Mm. Uh, I just want to ask as a first question if there is any, by any chance you had the opportunity to measure Hamaker constants for the, for, I know that now Maxine's there are many derivatives of them, mm -hmm. but were you, uh, ha have you had the chance to measure Hamaker constant of these materials or control such a property? No, we ourselves didn't, but there are lots of things for materials have not been done, not because they cannot be done, because simply they have not been done yet. And while I have a very large research group, and we work on many, probably too many different topics, we still cannot do everything. But what this also means that there is plenty of room for discovery. And again, also, thank you for actually stressing this. The key is really of all these properties and thing of vaccines here, that they are tunable, controllable. You can control properties by controlling number of layers, but controlling transition metal, carbon, nitrogen, but designing various structures, by changing surface chemistry, 
for multi-layer films by inserting, intercalating ions on molecules, for example, make space between the layers for transport, by also uh, grafting organic molecules on the surface, and it's again big difference from graphene, you can graft something on the surface covalently, and you won't kill the conductivity by doing this, for example, things here. So this is really tunability, but we need to learn how to do it. And again, in my opinion, it's not impossible without computational uh, prediction of properties. Otherwise, we can spend the rest of our life, all of us, researching Maxine and still won't be uh, where we need to be. Hello, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, so I noticed how, how much you talked about how much Maxine's like override graphene um, in their properties and whatnot, but is there a way you can combine these two materials together to maybe accentuate their properties? Yes, short answer is yes. We can, and we actually do it, and we combine with Maxine, as I showed in some of the first slide, I just didn't focus on this, with graphene, we combine Maxine uh, with carbon nanotubes because it's not like a Maxine came and graphene is gone. You know, like we're out of stone age, but a patio in my house is still made of stone right here. New materials open new opportunities. And in the case of 2D materials, we really need to look at different materials. You build a battery, you need different materials for cathode and anode. Graphene can work better on one side, Maxine on the other side. You can take as a current collector, for example, uh, Maxine uh, on the anode side, say graphene at the cathode side. You can use graphene carbon nanotubes as conducting additive. Graphene and Maxine will form dissimilar interfaces if you assemble them. And it will show the accelerates transport of ions when you build energy storage devices or uh, separation devices here. So short answer is again, yes, definitely yes. Moreover, we need to learn how to build hybrid materials. Thank you. I think this side is more active in asking questions. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, Professor uh, Yuri. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. I'm really interested into this. Uh, my question is related to um, uh, peeling off a single layer of magazine. So I was wondering, have you tried like mechanically peeling a single layer of the magazine? Or I was wondering, is it possible? Or apart from chemical techniques, can we peel one layer of magazine using adhesives or it something? Is, it is possible. But there are two things. One. The same surface charges and strong interactions that I mentioned, for example, prevent Maxine from dusting, form right away after drying strong films, make it more difficult to peel it off. But you can do it, you can basically mechanically exfoliate by, for example, milling, or we use, for example, three roll mill, we published a paper recently. You can basically separate Maxine without intercalation or mix them with polymer material and separate at the same time. And also it had been shown even from max phase, it's possible still to mechanically separate sheets. You cannot make easily single layer sheets. So it is possible, but it doesn't seem to be an optimal way to do. Also, let me mention, there will be two papers coming in science and advanced materials in the next couple of weeks. Actually, our paper, advanced material paper and science, Dmitry Talapin, describing direct synthesis of Maxine from two-dimensional oxide in our article and from graphene, graphite, and by CVD in article by Dmitry Talapin. So there are other methods emerging. And what you see here, for example, this is about like a 20 micron flakes of uh, Maxine single layer flakes. It's optical microscopy. You can see it on the silicon wafer with oxide here. And we are trying to push it to 40, 50 microns that we can make large flake by solution processing. It's also interesting. I can tell you right away, these flakes are very strong. Even some, you see some cracks and breakage because 
I doubt that anyone has ever seen solution processed monolayer, so it means that sub nanometer in thickness, graphene, oh sorry, not graphene, graphene is the only one you can actually see, graphene oxide, any metal chalcogenide, any oxide, which have been studied by thousands of people for decades. I've never seen solution process flakes larger than maybe one, two micrometers. They simply break because they're not mechanically strong enough here. You can do it here. So at the moment, we're exploring here. But again, depending on application, you may be interested to get in CVD and PVD methods, basically vapor phase deposition developed. People look at various methods also etching it electrochemically, for example, also making using molten salts, which you can get different chemistry. So there are many different ways to make it, and people in the community are trying to adjust them for specific purposes, for specific applications here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think this side is now also taking off. Thank, thank you, yeah. uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Yuri. It is a wonderful presentation. Uh, you also made an analogy to uh, clay materials, uh, these mm -hmm. 2D materials. And in clay, uh, these nano clays are uh, widely used to make uh, composites with uh, polymers, and they're called nano composites with enhanced uh, mechanical mm -hmm. strength, uh, flame retardancy, gas barrier mm -hmm. properties, and a lot of area. Uh, we throw the big area. Could we expect uh, similar uh, uh, things for this uh, magazine? Yes. Thing? You can make composite materials which will be as good as clay. Does it make sense? Probably not, just because this clay is significantly less expensive. So, if you want to reinforce car uh, bumper of a car, or make a polymer with lower permeability, what clay is used for, doesn't make sense to use maxine. However, if you want to make, for example, this composite, but also make it not only structurally strong, but also shielding radiation, or electrically conducting that it will also dissipate static electricity. Or you can use very thin layers of polymers to basically bond the maxine sheets and make flexible and strong polymeric films or fibers to making functional fabrics. This is what maxine makes sense. So maxine can be introduced into polymer, ceramic mattresses and also metal mattresses, particularly light metals, increasing strength without losing ductility. But I think it's always very important when you have new materials, think where use of those materials makes sense and when not. So again, there are certainly composite applications where use of maxine provides absolutely unique properties. You can strongly bond maxine to polymer, including covalent bonding like epoxy, for example, with a means. You can achieve this unique electronic properties. Uh, but this is where you need to look for application here. But otherwise, actually, chemically, it's a hydrophilic two-dimensional particles like clay or graphene oxide, if you want another analog for processing. Very similar. So everything you know about processing clay or graphene oxide nanoparticles in solution, you can equally apply to maxims. Thank you, Yuri, for this wonderful talk. It's very inspiring, and uh, and uh, listen to your story of uh, making the cycle in your scientific career. I think it's uh, very inspiring to to listen. I have uh, a quick question about water desalination. As you know, this region is really suffering from uh, water shortage, and water mm -hmm. desalination is a big topic. Mm -hmm. And I know that graphene was hailed one of the you know, materials to solve this problem, but nothing has happened so far. What makes you believe that uh, Maxine could be the potential game changer for making membranes for desalination? Uh, look, it's a very good question. Just like with many other things, there are some assumptions. People praise the graphene as materials you can make nanoscale holes and uh, you will basically with extremely thin membrane reject salt. Then there have been a number of publications, including from Manchester Group, co-authored by Andrew Geim, on using maxine membrane, graphene membrane, sorry, graphene oxide largely for filtering. But what appeared that 
they swell when water goes in and then ions can easily penetrate. And mechanical clamping is probably not practical here. So there are challenges. Good thing about Maxins, we are too early stage to fully understand what the challenges are, so we still need to play with them. But on a serious note, what is important? We always need to think of pros and cons. For example, Maxine combines properties of graphene, conductivity, and actually take us to the next high level, and graphene oxide, good weighting and uh, low contact angle and hydrophilicity. So what we can do, we can make a membrane similar to graphene oxide, but now we can use potential to control or prevent the flow of ions. So we have extra chance to do it. The other technology we are exploring, we are looking into capacitive deionization. So it's basically like using supercapacitor, attracting ions, but not with the goal to store charge, which is actually stored and recovered on the cycle, but with the goal to pull ions out of from water. So you can look at this like uh, if you take, uh, uh, say, reverse osmosis, you take water out of solution. So for highly concentrated solution, it makes sense, right, yeah, to take water out of brine. But if you have low concentration, like brackish water, taking water out when there are relatively few ions doesn't make sense. It makes more sense to take ions out of water. And for this, capacitive deionization looks like a very promising technology, and people have been using carbon, porous carbon, like in supercapacitors. But it was shown, and there is a spike of activity since the last two, three years, virtually, that when you use redox-active materials, like maxine, like manganese dioxide, it's possible to pull ions more efficiently because you get higher capacitance, basically, simply. Like a, maxine has about 10 times higher aerial capacitance compared to uh, carbon. And at the same time, because of high conductivity, there are lower energy losses, resistive losses here. So I think this is where there is a promise. Will it successfully compete with other technologies? We don't know. But we see that based on properties, there is promise to explore it in these two directions. There are also people who use photothermal effect. The same is used, for example, to hit particles in cells and kill tumors or, for example, that provide colors that I showed to you. But there is another challenge there. So you can basically put graphene, maxine particles in water. They have very efficient light to heat converters, and water will evaporate. But the question stays, will they be sufficiently long oxidation stable, hydrolysis stable, because they're carbides, nitrides can oxidize. So there are many questions which are still open. There are publication on all these type of applications already which one of them will have a chance, which will be competitive. This is exactly what one needs to explore to provide definitive answers. And all these materials are still looking for killer application, even graphene after invest billions of dollars in investments. After 30 plus thousands of papers being published every year of the past few years, it still doesn't have a killer application. It's still looking where it can make a really, really big difference. Carbon nanotubes, materials were again praised as miracle materials before. Uh, graphene, they didn't find application electronics, but they are used in hundreds of tons now to reinforce and provide conductivity to battery electrodes. So they found very important market, but not the one that anyone initially expected here. So we will see what the future holds for Maxins, and I think this is probably a good moment to finish uh, because I know uh, we need to leave by eight o'clock and food and drinks are waiting for you outside. Uh, thank you for being patient and listening to me uh, for an hour and a half. Thank you. So thank you, Yuri, again for uh, this wonderful talk. Uh, thanks uh, to Punch for uh, uh, making this uh, successful event possible. I thank you all for your attention. I wish you a great evening. Shukra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.